and we are saying let's spot it let's stop it let's cure it and we have in our midst um, Sheikh Faisal Abubakar we want to acknowledge his presence he's an Islamic scholar let's acknowledge Sheikh Faisal Abubakar so we are at a very important aspect of the program which is a discussion Manaba. of course and before we go on we also have to say a big thank you once again i i miss his name dr koran from he's a director of the noguchi memorial institute thank you once again for coming this morning i also have to say a big thank you to chief our, our chief operating officer mr rupanka majumda who's seated behind uh thank you so much and also to beatrice echampoma abe I must add she's a missus and she's the managing news editor for TV3. Now we are going to get into a discussion right now. All the questions that you have on your mind. If you're not here at the moment, no problem. Uh, if you're a social media fanatic or addicts like I am, well, go on to Twitter now. The hashtag is trending. Uh, TV3 platform and leave your questions there we have a gentleman behind who's coordinating all the responses on social media so it is trending hashtag tv3 platform and all your questions will be answered right now so now we'll go to our first questioner here you introduce yourself your name where you're from and you're entitled to one question and direct your question to a specific person please thank you Good morning, and I would like to commend tv3 for this discussion my first, my question goes to uh, Dr. Victor Bampo. When we say how prepared is Ghana, mostly we tackle this issue from um, the medical perspective. But I think that how prepared is Ghana should rather involve how prepared are we the citizens? Um, the issue I think uh, uh, rightly mentioned by the Honorable uh, Deputy Minister the, and the colleague here, our friends here, about uh, humor management and having the information, correct information. I think knowledge is power, so let's start from there. And uh, the social mobilization team uh, that is chaired by the, you know, also under the lubric of the whole um, uh, Ministry of Health, what we are trying to look at that we don't want to create panic by just sending information and mobilizing people on wrong information. So the first thing that is most important is to get out the right information. In other countries, what we found that Ebola kills has actually damaged more than actually giving the hope of how it can be addressed. So here we have, we are uh, working together, it's an interministerial committee uh, where also civil society, private sector partners are all involved looking at different forums that how we can take this information, the right information out at the right time. There are areas that we will be looking at on uh, a hotline where you can access the right information. It will be uh, set up. There will be tools, standardized tools that would be taken for different, again, the channels that our uh, traditional leaders, our religious leaders, um, the education system, which is very critical to give this right information out, and UNICEF and WHO and the UN and the development partners under the guidance of the government, we are working together to actually bring out a, a package that we can take it out to people with the right information. But I think the main issue around that would be knowledge is power, let's read, let's have the right knowledge and also spread the right knowledge. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll ask um, my colleague from the Public Health Division to answer the second question. Um, um, thank you very much. Um, my name is Esiedi Bekwe. I think the question was what preventive mechanisms are in place in the psychiatry hospital. Yes, um, let me say that um, as a general directive, um, the, the Ministry of Health is looking at preparing health facilities to address the challenge of Ebola. In that directive, we are supposed to ensure that all health staff are trained. The training, as has been said by the Deputy Minister, has gone through phases. Initially, this, this generalized orientation that has gone through all health facilities. Now, we have had specialized kind of training that has taken place in Accra, Kumasi, and the northern regions of Ghana. And these trainings are supposed to be cascaded down to the health facilities. So the health professionals are clear in their mind what to do. What has also been developed is the development of SOPs and protocols. That involves how to triage so you can easily identify a suspected case and what to do. The direction is that health facilities must have a holding room, which is different from an isolation unit or a treatment center. 
a place that you can easily pick the case that you suspect and then put in that, that patient. I'm hoping that the psychiatric unit will have such a holding place so that if you think that this case could be having Ebola, you immediately move that patient to that holding place and then you, co you get into contact with the nearest um, health facility um, authority that we can act on it. I would say that the one challenge was the use of the PPEs and the availability of the PPEs. The PPEs are mainly to handle when you think that this is a case of a suspected case of Ebola. So it's not routine that any person that you think is an alert, you wear a PPE. So the government has provided some PPEs to a number of the health facilities and there's a stockpile at the Central American store. If you think that this could be a case, then in that case, the, the focus will be moved to that facility and to provide it. I think that it is not, a, not in terms of numbers, but there are quite a number of these PPEs. If you think it's a case, you are letting the system and to provide it. I think that we are not so much at the ultimate, but if a case is alerted, I think the immediate steps will be taken. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we'll take another set of questions. Nanaba, up. Yes. Yes. The next question, please. I'm Daniel Tetechawe, a tutor, St. Thomas Aquinas Secondary School. Ebola was discovered about four, four decades ago on African soil. Ever since it was discovered, scientists in Europe have frantically tried to come out with a cure. Now my question is, what is the scientist in Africa and for that matter Ghana doing to also come out with a vaccine? Thank you. Was your question directed at Doc all of them? Doctor, Doctor, uh, 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 Doctor Duse. Yes. Okay. Okay. So I think before Doctor Duse would answer that, we will take one more question from Reverend Opuni, and then we will progress. Yeah. Thank you. And let me say thank you to TV3 for bringing all of us here uh, together. Now, when I hear the state of our readiness, it seems to me the impression is when people. Uh, have the infection, they'll go to hospital. So let's get our hospitals ready. But as we talk about the medical readiness, can we also talk about the social readiness? Because we live in a country where some people are not well. The first point of call is not hospitals. It's not even clinics. They go to church. They go to the mocks, the imams. They go to the shrines. But so far, at least I'm the General Secretary of Christian Council of Ghana. The churches, we have not been brought into all the discussions seriously. We are doing our own campaign, all the committees. We've not been invited. And I know the same with the Muslims. And, and as for the traditional priests, uh, it may be worse. Now, at what point, and here I'm talking to the donors, WHO and government, at what point do you want to bring some of us, the religious bodies, into the issue because in Liberia, they had a spread in the churches and traditional leaders who gave impression that they had cure for Ebola. You are waiting uh, uh, for too long. We are ready. But it seems you are not ready for us. <laughs> let's, let's applaud him. I'm loving the platform because the ideas are great. So Dr. Opokwe Bissell would address this and then um, we'll progress. Uh, uh, my teacher, what you ask is um, true. Before I give on it to my professor, who is the director of Noguchi, he is actually supposed to develop the vaccines. But then, there was an article in one of the dailies on cholera that said cholera mpunye. Cholera has infected more than 25,000 Ghanaians and killed more than 200. Cholera is so preventable. Provide water, toilet, education. And we are done with this. So if we cannot treat cholera, we will have a scene. Professor, over to you. <laughs> well, I, I don't know whether this is a trap or what. But um, basically, I mean, there are a lot of things going on. Um, there's a lot of things that you need to do to be able to work with this particular virus. And the infrastructure we have in this country will not, at the moment, uh, be amenable to try to develop a vaccine 
with this virus in terms of manipulating it. Uh, that having been said, I can tell you that we at Noguchi and a few people in the country are actually preparing to take part in the various via trials of the vaccines that have been developed. Currently, there's a phase one trial. There are phase one trials going on in Oxford, Lausanne, Mali. Uh, some is going to start in Uganda, Uganda, Gabon, and Kenya. And we hope that by December ending, we would know that the safety of the vaccines are okay to be given to more people. And we'll go on to what is called phase two, and we are planning to uh, take part in the phase two trials in two sites in the country. So there are various things you could do. You could help develop the vaccine, which if you have the infrastructure, we have what is called a biosafety level four lab, where you wear uh, more was it protective equipment than what we are seeing for the treatment and things like that. We won't go into that. But we are really working on helping in the development of the vaccine. One of the issues about the vaccine is unlike drugs, where somebody is sick and you're looking at, okay, if you don't treat, you may die. If you treat, you may live. So you want to treat and you're not sure about the drug. With a vaccine, you're going to give it to healthy people. So you don't want to give a vaccine to somebody and then he comes with a headache or diarrhea or anything. So you need to do very, very serious studies. And that is why sometimes it takes like, it looks like it takes a long time to develop these things. So uh, don't lose hope. We are doing what we can do with what we have in terms of looking at vaccines and treatments. Thank you, my professor. Thank you very much, Prof. Um, while we continue to acknowledge our sponsors for the program, we thank Natrade Ghana for giving us the support to bring this lovely program to all our viewers. So we take our next set of questions. My name is Dr. Yao Adijanfi, the Chief Executive of Dan Adams Pharmaceutical and the Vice President of Association of Ghana Industries. My question is the working people who are given medicines, products to Ghana, and we are talking about investment even into vaccines. But as we speak now, my Honorable Deputy Minister knows that even common injectable drugs, none is even made in Ghana. And even the oral medicines that we are swallowing, 70% are still being imported. Only 30% are produced locally. When is the time coming? that we are going to empower our local manufacturers to be able to do pharmaceuticals before even now orals to move into injectables before we even think about vaccines to build our own because if we don't and this Ebola is on our case now how long are we going to wait for things to come from America or India to support us simple thing I'm saying is that for Ghana to move forward the manufacturing sector, the research and development into our own, because Chinese are using their natural herbs. Indians are using their natural herbs, but we still import from them. So we must look at the aspect of the industry of this country in the area of health to promote the health care of the people of Ghana. And with WHO and Minister of Health and Minister of Trade and Industry, to look at the local manufacturing sector so that we can build our own grown home thing in terms of research, development, and productivity of medicines to take care of. Because today is Ebola. We don't know what is next coming. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now, Dr. Uh, Rabolo will answer the question about the, ch the involvement of churches very soon. But before then, we'll take one question from a student, and then she would come in. Okay, my name is... My name is Noah Ketuk, first boy's prevent of Labon in Senior High. In our various schools, we've been provided with Veronica Market for washing her. That is one of the effective me uh, measures put in place in preventing Ebola. But here lies the case, 45 students in the class use the same bucket that is hand washing. The, the same person goes there to open the tap and wash the hand. The next person also uses the same hand to open the same tap and wash. So what are the government, let me say, Okay, the question actually goes to Deputy Minister of Health, that's Dr. Victor Bimpo. What are they doing in the various schools to prevent Ebola? Thank you. Thank you very much. Madam? Okay, thank you. Um, I would like to say that um, 
the Reverend is absolutely right. We need to do more in terms of engaging the different um, um, religious denominations, the traditional leaders, so that you can amplify the message out to the community. It is not that nothing has been done. I think uh, some work has taken place and the Honorable uh, Deputy Minister will uh, mention the different uh, actions that have taken place so far. But we do recognize that we need to do more in that particular area. There are plans that have been uh, put in place together with uh, uh, our colleagues from UNICEF and uh, other uh, UN organizations and uh, civil society so that we reach out through you. We reach the masses that need the information on what to do to prevent uh, infection and in case they feel they are not well, what do they need to do. We hear you loud and clear. You are absolutely right. We need to step up efforts on that matter. I want to talk about the vaccine briefly to say that, like Prof said, you need high level of um, sophistication to deal with this virus. So if you think that out of the 54 countries in Africa, very few can even diagnose Ebola, let alone be able to work on coming up with the vaccine. And this is a call for our leaders, for our heads of state and government. Let's make sure that we give the health sector the support they need so that they can produce the medicines that we use, they can produce the vaccines that we need. The story of Ebola is telling us what we knew for too long. When the market is too small, when the market is seen as being too small, there is no appetite for the industry in the developed world to work on vaccines and medicines that will be coming to a continent that is seen as being poor and people don't have the power purchase to buy those medicines and vaccines. So what do we need to do is to be resilient and count on our own energy and resources and do the things that we need for our own people. Thank you. So the, okay, so the Honorable Minister would want um, him to help us, Franklin, to help us with the response to the students. Um, um, thank you very much. Um, let me say that the fight against Ebola is not purely a function of the Ministry of Health. It's a collective Ghanaian effort. All sectors are involved. That's why this platform is good, that all Ghanaians might see themselves as contributors and collaborators. So don't always be looking at Dr. Bampo as a solution. As a Ghanaian plan, there is a response from the education sector. So the education sector has its own plan. We will try and give you an answer, but I hope that when you go, talk to your headmistress or head, headmaster. You see, the, there's a clear plan. The, the, the Ministry of Health has provided technical assistance to the Ministry of Health to come out with their preparedness plan. We don't want to give, create fear and panic. The essence of this forum is that you need to be able to early detect a case, contain it and treat. That is why you are talking about spot, stop and cure. So there's no need to be afraid when you are in that community, whether you are students. What is you need to do is that I think that the schools have been provided with flyers and posters so that you can easily, immediately identify who could be ill. Then that person will be early detected and then sent to your sick bay. If such a person is ill in your, let's say, your dormitory, that's where the fear will come in because that ill person is the one who transferred the infection. The boy has something which is very good about it. It's only when you are ill that you can transmit. And that message is very crucial. So the fear must be kind of minimized. If you are not ill, you cannot transmit the infection. The best thing is that the best thing is that when you are using the, the, the when you are using the, the verica packet, you can use your elbow to turn the tap. You see? Listen, listen. What I'm telling you that what is important is that you detect who is ill very early and then you move that patient away. So that you don't have a set of ill people around who can share the infection. And that is the most important thing that we want all of you to do. And then the facilities must have a holding bay that can easily move the patient to that facility. And then they will inform the health system who will now come and address the situation for you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we'll take another set of two questions and then...
responses. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. My name is Dorinda Machi of Laboni Senior High. My question goes to the GME president. Um, the Deputy Minister of Health mentioned in his speech something about serum that will be given to Ebola patients once we record a case. Now, I want to ask that how do we treat the blood to turn it into serum? And how prepared is our country with the equipment to turn the blood into serum? Thank you. Thank you very much. Next question. My name is Etona Magley. I'm from the Ghana Institute of Journalism. In Liberia, there are workers who have gone on strike over service and pay conditions. In view of this development, how do we intend to take care of our health workers? What plans are there for them? And also, how do we intend to reach the deaf and the blind in terms of public education? Thank you. Director to who, sorry? To, to Dr. Victor Bampo. Okay. I think we'll take one more. My name is William Ankara from Ghana Institute of Journalism. Um, please, my question goes to WHO country rep. Um, as Ghana becomes the epicenter of the effort combating the Ebola virus, um, there has been some personnel and equipment moving to and fro from Ghana to the affected countries. I want to ask if um, WHO has any plans to curb or prevent Ghana from contracting the disease. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we take some responses now. First from the minister. Okay. I'm trying to. Um, first of all, let me touch on uh, Dr. Edu Jenfi's question um, very quickly. My, my big brother, uh, Dan Adams. Um, just to say that one of the things you refused to, you didn't mention, was that you are also a very big advocate for local industry. And the answer is very simple. I, I think you heard uh, the Minister of Finance's budget yesterday, and His Excellency the President is really committed to um, making sure that local in industry grows. And I think that something was done about the taxes on local industry. We need to do more, but that's a very good start. So that's where I'll, I'll leave it. The second question I wanted to tackle was about uh, the strike in Liberia and the fact that the question about what government is doing about health workers. I think time did not permit me to go into detail about um, what is happening in terms of how to make sure that health workers are adequately re uh, compensated. But we know that there are two groups of uh, people who are most affected when Ebola comes. The first is the caregivers at home and the second is the health workers. What we've done is that we've putting in place mechanisms to provide the tools to make sure that they don't get infected in the same place, in the first place. So PPEs, adequate training to provide the confidence that they can go in and work. Now when they go in, they are provided with a cash incentive. In the unfortunate event that they die, then there will be a lump sum given to them. Secondly, there will be a provision that has been worked out with the state insurance uh, company to provide um, uh, their remuneration to their families until they are 60, they, you know, when they would have been 60 years. Finally, like I said, government will do all it can. We've been in discussions with WHO to make sure that the very latest um, uh, drugs, the very latest uh, tools for managing the cases would be provided. Now, that is a moving target. It keeps changing. So I think as Prof um, said, Vaccines, for example, will be coming in sometime in January. So it's a, a fluid um, discussion that we are having. But that is what government has in place. The final thing I wanted to um, say is that because of the confidence that it is continuing to be built, we had a request from the West African Health Organization for Ghanaians to volunteer, to go to the affected countries, to go and uh, work there. And I'm sure you would say, oh, nobody will go. We have 40 names on that list because of the confidence that is being built and because of the fact that they know that with the training and so on they, they, they can give a certain uh, kind of uh, support to the affected countries. The final one is about the deaf and the blind. One of the gaps in the response that we have to work on very quickly. I know that some tools have been developed. It's not nearly enough but we are working with our partners as well to ramp that up. Thank you. So we'll take Dr. Um, my answer will be at two levels. Uh, what are we doing to uh, prevent, uh, to help Ghana prevent uh, um, uh, infections? We are working with the ministry 
and uh, its partners, when I say we, uh, I mean the UN family, the, the, the donor community, to support preparedness efforts, both in terms of planning, but doing the social mobilization, the public education, the trainings that uh, you have heard about in complementing government efforts. On the, the, um, the people who go and come from Amir, and I think this is where the concern is, I would like to say that Amir has a very strong, carefully planned strategy to not only protect the, um, the people who travel to those countries and come back, but to make sure that they do not pass on. In the unfortunate event that one of them becomes sick, they do not pass on uh, the um, infection to the community in Ghana. What people need to know is that the people at the headquarters here in Anmir are not frontline workers. They are not managing patients when they go to Sierra Leone, Guinea, and Liberia. They are not at high risk of contracting infection themselves. You may say, well, but the disease is widespread in those countries and you never know whom you get in contact with. That's very true. And that's why there is a medical facility dedicated, uh, a medical doctor dedicated to them. They are trained on a regular basis on how to protect themselves as they go in and they go out. And every care is being taken to minimize the risk of those people being infected and minimize the risk of introducing uh, introducing uh, an infection into into Ghana. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think the GMA president wants to make a... My younger sister wanted to know how the room is prepared and how we are going to get it. Before I give it to my professor, Professor Kura, who is also a member of the Ghana Medical Association, a strong senior. Um, ordinarily, it would be like uh, how is chloroquine or paracetamol or other things prepared. But because we are students, uh, he will answer you well. But before that time, the whole package for the health staff and all those who come into contact with um, Ebola and contractors, and that the best care anywhere must be um, given to that individual. This is a document that we presented to the ministry, as I, I said in my earlier um, discourse. We are here to sign a proper MOU so that we know, all the parties know, Gavin, this is your side, worker or the volunteer is your side so that it doesn't become uh, just so that what is the legal basis of all this so yes um, that document i hope will be signed before ebola comes to ghana we have lesson from liberia so you know when in the middle of it have a case run away and even then touching on what uh, my man of god said i read yesterday that in one of the villages they actually killed five the community killed five five workers because they didn't understand uh, the Ebola process properly. And we need to also educate our community and everybody involved so that the average Ghanaian knows what is Ebola, how, that, how has it transmitted and all those things, so that all these atrocities uh, don't come to our part of the world. So, my professor, how you prepare serum and how you get serum for me when I contract Ebola? Okay, Paul. Mr. President, I think you take note that I'm not on the high steam. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Um, that was a good question, but basically, you are right because when you give blood from one individual to the other, you have um, the risk of having serum sickness. The other person reacting to the blood, so that will be uh, dealt with. The good thing now is that we have more than five thousand individuals who have actually recovered from Ebola. What it means is that their bodies have been able to produce antibodies against the virus. 